SS Alchemos, the cursed ship of World War II. Sometimes it's hard to separate fact from fiction, and this is very much the case when it comes to the seemingly cursed ship, the SS Alchemos. Therefore, what you're about to hear is in part a proven fact, while other parts are speculation, rumor, and possible urban myth. So, judge for yourself the mysterious tale of the cursed merchant ship of many names. The story starts in the midst of World War II, when the Nazi U-boat menace was threatening Allied shipping all across the North Atlantic. There soon emerged a desperate need to replace Allied mounting losses, especially among its merchant fleet, as quickly as possible. Out of this situation was born a whole new concept, a merchant ship that would be welded together from massive hull prefabricated sections on an assembly-style production line. This offered a quick way to manufacture at a low cost a much-needed standardized class of merchant ship. These Liberty ships were produced between 1941 to 1945, and American shipyards built a staggering 2,710 of them. The average time to complete one of these ships was incredibly just six weeks. This meant corners were cut, and quality at times was questionable. There were even instances of these ships falling apart at sea without warning. In the midst of all this production chaos on October 11, 1943, the Liberty ship the George M. Shriver, identification number 1803, was launched at the Bethlehem Fairfield shipyards in Baltimore. It's rumored that while the ship was being constructed, that a group of welders were accidentally sealed inside the hull crawl space during the welding process. Despite their screams for help and relentless banging on the inside of the hull, they were not discovered until the next day, by which time they had all suffocated to death. Just nine days after the ship was launched, it was assigned to the Free Norwegian Merchant Shipping Fleet and renamed the Vigo Hunstein, in honor of a Norwegian civil rights lawyer who had been executed by a Nazi firing squad in 1941. The majority of those stationed on this ship were Norwegian or Canadian, the ship's primary use was to travel throughout the Mediterranean and into the Indian Ocean via the Suez Canal. Ammunition and other materials needed to create weapons were being transported. The ship soon got a reputation for being cursed, despite surviving several attacks by German aircraft and U-boats while doing convoy duties. For things on board would creepily malfunction. Lights would flicker on and off for no apparent reason at all. The radio would at random times angrily hiss out static like a soul in anguish, and the ship's engines would constantly break down. Though no good reason could ever be found why this kept happening. Many of the crew would complain that parts of the ships would get eerily cold, despite the ship starting to operate in the warmer climate of the Mediterranean Sea. Worse was to come when in May 1944 the ship was assigned near Naples, Italy, when a 28-year-old Canadian radio operator, Maud Steen, was brought aboard. Steen wanted to fight in the war, but Canada, much like other allied nations, would not allow women to fight. So she joined a Norwegian company that allowed women on ships. Within just three months of her arriving, she was shot dead by another crew member while the ship was off the coast of Italy. But the motive for the crew member's actions was never discovered, and straight after the killing he mysteriously turned the gun on himself in what seemed to be a murder-suicide. Due to the horrific state of her death, the military claimed that she died due to enemy fire fearing the repercussions if the true nature of her death was discovered. The Vigo Hanstein would survive the war, as did, surprisingly, most of her fellow Liberty ships. In fact, just over 10% were actually lost during the war. Of the remaining 2,400, most of them were sold off cheaply to commercial shipping companies. Greek entrepreneurs bought a staggering 526 of them after the war, including the Vigo Hanstein in 1947. The ship was renamed yet again, this time as the SS Alchemos, which means strong in Greek. But still, her cursed reputation followed the ship around, and crew members claim they often saw terrifying ghostly apparitions when on board. The ship's reputation was so bad that many thought it was haunted, and often sailors would refuse to serve on her, being too terrified of the evil spirits they thought dwelled there. It wasn't helped when a sister ship of the SS Alchemos, the Robert Dale Owen, that had been renamed Calliope, sank. It was operated by a Greek shipping company. The ship, under its new name, had hit a mine left over from the war and had unexplainably fallen apart immediately, taking most of her crew to a watery grave. The rest of the SS Alchemos's career was plagued by bad luck. 
on March 20, 1963, when the SS Alkamos was off the coast of Western Australia, just north of Perth, an ungodly storm appeared out of nowhere and drove the ship onto some nearby reefs. The next day, the ship had to be towed to the nearby port of Fremantle, where some basic repairs were done to keep the ship afloat. The ship was under repairs for two months, and disagreements over who was responsible for paying for the repairs arose. Even the ship caught fire randomly while in Fremantle. Then the plan was to tow the SS Alkamos to Hong Kong for a full overhaul. But the ship had barely made it out of harbor when her towing line mysteriously snapped and it ended up beached just a few hundred yards from the shore. Some say the storm howled in triumph and the sea applauded, having finally claimed the ship as her own. The SS Alkamos remained intact, but it was not able to float on its own. It was forced to drop anchor and the lower decks were flooded on purpose in order to stabilize the vessel so it wouldn't break up and become a danger to nearby shipping. The crew was then evacuated and a lone caretaker was placed on board. The man stayed on the ship all alone for months and months, some saying he went crazy by the isolation. He claimed that there were strange, sinister moaning that could be heard around the ship. He even reported seeing fresh blood dripping from the walls. The following year, another attempt was made to tow the ship, but this failed too. As if trying to escape, the SS Alkamos mysteriously broke its anchor chain on a clear and windless night and drifted almost suicidally onto the nearby treacherous Eglinton Rocks as if it was trying to end its own life. For the second time, the ship caught fire randomly. The SS Alkamos was later inspected and it was deemed too heavily damaged to be repaired. By now, it was 21 years old, and this simply reinforced the decision that the ship should be scrapped. It was way beyond its lifespan as Liberty ships were originally designed to last just a mere five years. During the attempts to start the salvaging process, work had to be halted when a fierce fire suddenly appeared, forcing the workers to evacuate. Eerily, the fire started up every time they tried to reboard it. So in the end, the salvage crew refused to return to the ship as they now believed it was cursed. Many accounts claim to have heard, seen, and smelled things while on board, even being pushed. A female caretaker fell while on board the vessel and suffered a miscarriage. By 1969, all hope had been given up in salvaging the ship, and the Navy wanted submariners to take measurements of the propeller. While on their way to the site, all three men were killed in a freak plane crash. Then a local long-distance swimmer inexplicably disappeared while training near the wreck, and his death was never solved. Many said that the ship had claimed him, as the ghost ship needed him to be one of its ghostly crew. It was even rumored his skull was later found in the engine room. Over 40 years since the SS Alkamos was abandoned to the sea, it now lies submerged just below the surface, and at every low tide, the top of her superstructure emerges once more, like a specter rising from the grave as if to mock the world that even in death, she is seemingly a ship that refuses to die. Unbelievable Plague Cures The Middle Ages The Black Death the bubonic plague, more commonly known as the Black Death, due to the black buboes that would swell in the armpits and groins of victims, decimated the population of Europe during the Middle Ages, from 1347 to 1351. These buboes would swell, sometimes as large as an egg, and turn black before eventually rupturing, oozing blood and pus, putting the person in agony. Other symptoms of the plague included fever, rashes, difficulty breathing, and vomiting blood. We associate the name the Black Death with this initial devastating outbreak, but in reality, the bubonic plague continued to affect and devastate Europe for the next few centuries. During the outbreak, the plague spread rapidly from the Middle East across continental Europe and then jumped the channel to the British Isles. As terror and disease ran rampant throughout Europe, people searched for answers. Some believe that God was punishing the human race for their sins through divine intervention or in the form of the disease. One of the most prominent theories was delivered to the King of France by a respected medical institution in France. They said that the cause of the plague was the conjunction of three planets in 1345, which then caused a great pestilence in the air. 
This was followed by the bad air theory or miasma theory, which became widely accepted everywhere. However, the Black Death was actually caused by bites from the fleas carried on rats. Due to the high death toll, streets were often littered with bodies that were left outside for the death collectors as they were to be taken away and buried in mass graves known as plague pits. Life had become so tragic that as one Italian citizen in 1348, Agnolo di Tura, stated, There was no one who wept for any death, for all awaited death. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. As the death toll increased and people continued to be struck down by the disease throughout Europe, and entire families were being wiped out, plague doctors began to get desperate and creative with so-called plague cures. These are some of those cures. Bloodletting One way physicians and plague doctors attempted to cure the Black Death was through bloodletting. Bloodletting was common during the Middle Ages, as it was believed that it expelled harmful humors from within the body that were causing the sickness. The practice of bloodletting involved leeching or cutting near to the site of the infection, in this case, the bubo. However, cutting into the skin to drain the blood often led to further infection, as the immune system was already weak and health conditions were unsanitary given the circumstances. Plague doctors would also sometimes lance the buboes, releasing a putrid odor along with blood and pus. Sweating Sweating was also a popular cure. In this case, the doctor would provide the patient with medicine that would raise their temperature. The idea was to make the patient sweat out the corruption from the blood that the disease caused. It was seen as a last resort treatment. Treacle One of the more pleasant ways of curing the plague was to use treacle, a type of syrup made of unrefined sugar. The catch was that the treacle had to be aged for at least 10 years to be an effective cure for the Black Death. The reasoning behind this cure was that the substance, which by that point would be horrific smelling and very sticky, was going to rid the body of the disease while simultaneously counteracting the effects of the disease. The treacle was drank in its thick syrupy form and was thought to completely rid the plague from the victim's body. While seemingly improbable, it is possible that over the course of the 10-year aging period that disease-fighting molds may have developed within the treacle that could help fight off the plague. Whether this saved anyone is largely unknown. Bathe in Urine Whilst we might find this a disgusting cure by today's clean standards, this isn't altogether unsurprising. Urine was believed to have healing properties and had been associated with medical issues since the days of Galen and Hippocrates. Urine was often examined in flasks by physicians who matched the color and consistency to illustrations. Victims of the plague were given urine to bathe in, with the thought being that it would relieve their symptoms. This was then taken further, and some victims were given urine to drink. Crushed Emeralds Unsurprisingly, this cure was more for the wealthy plague sufferer. The idea was that swallowing the precious stones would help to restore balance amongst the humors and therefore cure the victim. Emeralds weren't the only precious jewels used. Other minerals such as pearls were said to be effective. The stones were usually ground down and mixed with water to form a sparkly potation, one that was laced with little bits of emerald that probably felt like broken glass. Covering yourself in human excrement. Doctors would make a paste from human feces, flower roots, and some tree resins. The buboes would then be cut open and the paste would be smeared on. The open wound would then be tightly wrapped to keep the paste inside. Live in a sewer. On the face of it, this is a very counterproductive cure. However, medieval doctors thought that the plague was caused by the air. It was thought that the disgusting smells of the sewer would stop the less smelly but disease-ridden air from coming near them and therefore infecting them. 
Sadly, not only was it a disgusting cure, it also wasn't very effective as it often exposed victims to a variety of other nasty diseases. Whipping Yourself The Middle Ages were a particularly religious time and it's no wonder that people turned to God when they got the disease. They thought that it might be God's punishment for being sinful and that the only way to a cure was to punish themselves. They did this through flagellation. This was where they went into the streets and whipped themselves and each other to punish themselves for their sins in the hope that God would cure them. Dinner Parties Some doctors thought that stress made people more susceptible to the plague, so they recommended eating their meals with others in order to promote merrymaking and reduce stress. In Florence, Marchione di Capo Stefani describes how people used to take turns to host the dinners, although often two or three people wouldn't turn up. This cure helped to spread the plague more because of close contact with the infected. The Live Chicken Cure This may be the most puzzling of the plague cures. During the medieval period into the 18th century, a popular cure was the Live Chicken Cure or the Vickery Method. The live chicken treatment included taking a rooster, plucking its backside, and placing its rump onto the buboes of the plague victim. Supposedly, the bear chicken would draw out the poison in the buboes, therefore curing the plague victim of the terrible disease. The live chicken treatment was so popular throughout Europe that it was integrated into normal medical procedures for the plague victims by the 16th century. Some physicians believed that the heat from the chicken was what drew the poison from the buboes, while others simply believed the chicken balanced the humors within the body. Quarantine The most tried and true of the cures was the use of quarantine, which had begun to be implemented in Italy in 1348. Quarantine policies required that individuals, even entire families, be confined to or shut up in their homes until they had recovered from the plague and then be confined for a further 40 days afterwards. For many, that recovery never happened. Bodies littered the streets in front of the isolated houses. For when a family member died in quarantine, they would be left on the doorstep to be taken away to the plague pits. While plague quarantine policies did work in some ways, the death toll in London was still high at around 10,400 people, 7.5% of the city's population in 1636. Of course, these cures were not very successful and eventually the Black Death just went away. Later, it would return time and time again across the next few centuries. As time went on and medicine became more refined, doctors began to understand what remedies worked and why. Sanitation and quarantine became more and more important as cures, while others such as flagellation became less prominent. You might wonder why these cures were ever tried and if people really believe them to work. The answer is yes. Physicians and patients really believed that these cures were the right thing to do in stopping the plague. It is likely that the cures became widespread because someone tried them and it appeared to work. Word would spread and more people would try them. That means there were probably more crazy cures that were out there that we don't know about. The Burke and Hare Murders, 1827 to 1829. Number of Murders, 16. During the 19th century, the Scottish capital of Edinburgh was leading the way in medical advancements, none more so than in the study of the anatomy of the human body, but this in turn led to a severe shortage of corpses for teaching and research purposes. It was not helped by the fact that Scottish law at that time said that the only corpses allowed for dissections were restricted to those who had died in prison, suicide victims, or orphans. So in the 1820s, an illegal trade in corpses sprung up as they could fetch around 8 to 10 pounds each, which was a small fortune in those days. There were even instances of grave robbing, but they were highly exaggerated by the newspapers. But nevertheless, they did happen. In Edinburgh, on the night of November 29th, 1827, a lodger died owing rent money to his landlord. That landlord was William Hare. Angry that the lodger owed four pounds in rent, 
Hare decided to illegally sell the body for anatomical studies in order to recuperate his losses. To do this, he enlisted the help of his friend, William Burke, who helped him remove the body from the coffin, replacing it with tanning bark. The body was hid under the bed. Later on, they sold the corpse to Dr. Robert Knox, who paid them the handsome sum of seven pounds and 10 shillings. Seeing a money-making opportunity, they thought of ways to provide more corpses for Dr. Knox without waiting for natural causes. Over the next 12 months, they are thought to have killed 16 people in total with the aid of their wives, mainly by getting their victims drunk and smothering them to death. And despite popular belief, the two were never known to have robbed any graves. Their victims were either transients or homeless, the type of people no one would miss, and they were in plentiful supply in a growing city like Edinburgh. Their victims were made up of 12 women, two handicapped youths, and two men, one who was sick, while the other an old man. All of the corpses had been sold to Dr. Knox, who was head of the local anatomy school, and who later claimed, because of the way the victims were murdered, with no obvious signs of violence on their bodies, that he never suspected foul play. Though the courts believed Knox as not being involved in any criminal involvement, mainly due to Burke later testifying that Knox knew nothing of their illegal going-ons, the press and public opinion did not, and his career was ruined from that point onwards. Burke and Hare's last victim was on Halloween, October 31st, 1828, when Margaret Doherty, an Irish immigrant, was invited around to the Hare's for a drink. The next day, she was found murdered in one of the bedrooms by one of the lodgers. They tried to bribe the witness with £10 a week, but they refused. The lodger went to summon the police, but when they arrived at the lodgings, all they found was Doherty's blood-stained clothing hidden under the bed, but no body. The police's suspicions further arose when Burke and Hare, along with their wives, gave differing accounts and times concerning themselves and Doherty for the night before. The police line of inquiries quickly led them to Dr. Knox's dissecting rooms, where they found Doherty's body being made ready for dissection. The police now felt confident that they had all the evidence they needed and arrested Burke and Hare, along with their wives, for the murder of Margaret Doherty. But the authorities were not as confident as the police were, even though the police surgeon and two doctors who had examined Margaret Doherty's body had concluded that she had been murdered by suffocation, it could not be proven medically, and that was just their professional opinion. The other 15 victims had had their bodies dissected, veins stripped away, some body parts pickled, and other parts taken apart completely, down to the smallest detail, all this rendering an autopsy impossible to be carried out. Lastly, it was felt quick and decisive action was needed to be taken, as the newspapers were whipping up the public into a frenzy with sensational and inaccurate stories about how anyone who had gone missing had probably been murdered and their bodies sold to science. So the authorities offered Hare immunity from prosecution. He readily agreed, and this meant in turn all charges were dropped against his wife because her husband could not testify against his wife at that time. Hare confessed to Heisenberg's involvement in all the murders and on December 4, 1829, Burke and his wife were charged with three counts of murder, including that of Margaret Doherty. Their trial started at 10 a.m. on the Christmas Eve of 1828. It lasted throughout the night, and in the morning after, 55 minutes of deliberation at 9.25 a.m., the jury found Burke guilty of Margaret Doherty's murder. Burke's wife was acquitted of all charges. Burke's arrest to execution happened in a short amount of time and by an ironic twist. The judge had ordered that after his execution, Burke's skeleton was to be given to science, where it is now displayed in the Anatomical Museum of the Edinburgh Medical School. His death mask can be seen at Surgeon's Hall Museum, but there is also another more gruesome item on display, a book that was created from Burke's skin. Hare was released on February the 5th, 1829, a free man, and was last seen heading for the English border, and was never seen or heard of again. Three years later, the Anatomy Act of 1832 was passed. This allowed for the medical authorities to take any unclaimed bodies from the slum workhouses after 48 hours had passed. This freed up a lot of bodies for dissection and eased, though did not eradicate completely, the practice of illegally selling corpses. Elmer McCurdy, the dead gunslinger used as a movie prop. 1880 to 1977. 
The days of the Wild West were drawing to an end as stagecoach holdups, train robberies, and gun duels were becoming a thing of the past. Elmer McCurdy was an outlaw at this time, who proved to be very unsuccessful and not very good at it. But he would literally become more famous in death than he ever did in life. He was born in Washington in the state of Maine in 1880 and had a chaotic upbringing. He turned to drink at a very early age, probably due to all the turmoil he suffered as a child. Elmer trained as a plumber, but struggled to hold down a steady job due to his drinking and the severe downturn in the American economy. In 1905, at the age of 25, he was arrested for being drunk in public. This was the first time he had been in trouble with the law. But he seemed to quickly get his life back on track, and two years later, in 1907, he joined the United States Army. There, he qualified as a machine gun operator, as well as being trained in demolitions, learning a little bit about explosive ordnance like nitroglycerin. He left the Army in 1910 with an honorable discharge. However, just 12 days later, he was arrested, along with an old Army friend, for allegedly going equipped to commit burglary, as they were carrying chisels, hammers, and hacksaws at the time. Their defense was that the tools were needed to build a new type of pedal-operated machine gun they were working on. The jury believed them, and they were found not guilty on all charges. So, at 30 years old, apart from a minor charge for drunkenness, Elmer had led a seemingly honest and rather unexciting life. But it was all about to change, for reasons not too clear, as Elmer decided to turn to crime as a full-time career. Just over a year later, in March 1911, after carrying out a lot of unsuccessful petty crimes, he decided to form a gang and try for something much bigger. For they had decided to rob the Iron Mountain, Missouri Pacific train. But when blowing up the safe on board, Elmer had used far too much nitroglycerin explosive and destroyed the safe and most of the money inside. Their next big job was in Kansas in September that year, when they dug a hole in a bank's wall and attempted to blow up the bank's safe unsuccessfully. But he did manage to wreck the interior of the bank in the ensuing explosion and only got away with a little cash that had not been inside the safe. His final attempted robbery was just a month later, when Elmer and his gang attempted to rob a Union Pacific Railway train, said to be carrying over $400,000, which is about $10 million in today's value but they got the wrong train and ended up instead robbing a standard passenger train with disastrous results. They were forced in desperation to rob the railway staff and passengers, managing to steal only $46, two demijohns of whiskey, a revolver, a coat, and the train conductor's pocket watch. A newspaper later called Elmer's robbery one of the smallest in the history of train robbery. Elmer fled the train robbery and decided to hide in a hayloft at a friend's ranch but a sheriff's posse tracked him down using bloodhounds a few days later, and on the dawn of October 7th, there was a short gunfight in which Elmer was killed. Now, you'd think that this would be the end of McCurdy and his travels, with there being just his final trip to Boot Hill. In fact, it was just the beginning. Elmer's body was taken to the local funeral home where it went unclaimed. The undertaker, Joseph L. Johnson, subsequently refused to bury the body, as he was annoyed he had not been paid for his services. So he embalmed the body in an arsenic-based solution to preserve it and dressed it up along with placing a rifle in its hands. He placed the sign, The Bandit Who Wouldn't Give Up, next to it and charged visitors a nickel, which is five cents. That's just over a dollar in today's value for people to come and see it. It is said that you drop the payment into the corpse's open mouth, from where they were collected later by the undertaker. This went on until 1916 and proved a very popular attraction. Then, two men turned up at the funeral home and claimed to be Elmer's brothers. As they had already sought permission from the local authorities to take the body back to San Francisco for burial, the undertaker agreed to release the body to them. In fact, the body was shipped to Kansas to join a traveling carnival as a sideshow attraction, now labeled the outlaw who would never be captured alive. They advertised him wherever they went as the Oklahoma Mummy Man. The two men claiming to be Elmer's brothers were in fact James and Charles Patterson, the dishonest owners of the Great Patterson Carnival Show. Over the next 60 years, the attraction swapped hands many times. In 1922, James Patterson sold his carnival to Louis Sonny, who operated the traveling Museum of Crime featuring wax figures and famous outlaws. 
1933, Sonny loaned the body out to director Dwayne Esper, who used it to promote his low-budget movie, Narcotic. For this movie, Elmer's corpse, that was now shriveled and mummified by the passage of time, was used to portray a dead drug addict who had killed himself after being surrounded by police after robbing a store. It was displayed in the lobby of film theaters to advertise the movie and warn of the dangers of drug addiction. In 1949, the owner, Louis Sonny, died, and all his wax figurines along with Elmer's body were placed in storage. For nearly the next 20 years, there he laid forgotten until he was rediscovered and lent out as a prop for the 1967 horror B-movie, She Freak. He appeared for a few short seconds only in the background of one of the scenes. Then, he and all of the other wax figures were sold to a new wax museum owner. It seemed by now to have been forgotten that Elmer was a real-life corpse, and it was assumed that he was just one of the wax figures. His new owners displayed him for a while in an exhibition in a show at Mount Rushmore, but got rid of him after Elmer got accidentally damaged in a windstorm and was not lifelike enough to exhibit. McCurdy was then sold to Ed Leersch, a part owner of the New Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California, to be used as a prop. He was to be the hanged man swinging from the gallows covered in glowing neon paint in the Laugh in the Dark funhouse there. The amusement park attracted several television shows, including the hit show The Six Million Dollar Man, which came there to film an episode on December 8, 1976. When the figure was being moved in preparation to film a scene, its arm broke off, revealing human bone and tissue. The authorities were informed, and after an extensive investigation by the Los Angeles Coroner's Department, including the use of superimposing radiographs of the corpse's skull over known photographs of Elmer, it was confirmed it was the long-dead outlaw Elmer McCurdy. Among the clues that helped identify the body were a 1924 penny and ticket stubs to Lewis Sonny's Museum of Crime lodged inside the throat of the corpse. Moreover, the copper bullet jacket lodged in him had not appeared on American ammunition until around 1905, and the arsenic with which he was embalmed had fallen out of use around 1920, narrowing the time of death to a window of 15 years. Elmer was buried on April 22, 1977, in the Boot Hill section of Summit View Cemetery in Guthrie, Oklahoma, 66 years after his death. He was laid to rest beneath several feet of concrete as the police wanted to deter anyone from digging him up. His funeral was attended by over 300 people. Elizabeth Bathory, the countess that bathed in the blood of her victims. Hungary, 16th and 17th century. In Hungary, 1514, the Doja Rebellion, a bloody peasant revolt led by a nobleman called Georgi Doja, nearly succeeded in overthrowing the country's aristocracy. After this failed rebellion, the aristocracy needed to maintain their grip of power, so they passed a series of laws giving them unlimited control over the people. To set the example, severe punishments were handed out to the revolt's leader, Doja was forced to sit on a boiling hot iron throne-like chair and wear a red-hot iron crown while grasping a scorching royal scepter until he died from burns and shock. So when the Countess Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7, 1560, she was born into a world where the nobility had absolute power over their people. She would be the product of inbreeding between Baron George Bathory and Baroness Anna Bathory, Elizabeth had three siblings, one brother and two sisters. Her family was one of the wealthiest and influential in the kingdom, ruling Transylvania as a virtually independent principality. The Countess grew up to be well-educated with a good understanding of mathematics, as well as learning to speak fluently in four languages, her native Hungarian, as well as Latin, Greek, and German. She was engaged at a very early age to the son of an influential baron, who she then later married at the age of 15. It is said around 4,500 people attended the wedding. Elizabeth received Kachicek Castle, a 13th century fortification situated in what is now modern-day Slovakia, as a wedding gift from her husband. The couple had at least five children, but only three survived infancy. Her husband, Count Ferenc Nadazdio, nicknamed the Black Knight of Hungary, was now a general and was often away fighting in the Ottoman Empire. His military career was highly successful, and in time he rose to the rank of chief commander of the Hungarian army. It is said that Nadazdil, like Vlad the Impaler, who was the inspiration for Dracula, 
liked impaling Turkish prisoners alive on giant wooden stakes and then enjoying watching them die a slow, painful death. In 1601, the Count was struck down by an unknown disabling disease and three years later at the age of 48, succumbed to the illness and died. He and the Countess had been married for nearly 30 years. Shortly after her husband's elaborate grand funeral, Elizabeth went on and did something quite odd. She took a trip to Vienna for an extravagant shopping trip and spent a vast fortune on the finest clothing for her and her servants. After her husband's death, Elizabeth went against Hungarian tradition, where the convention was that the widow retires from public life for a year and mourns quietly in private. She was a public figure, getting involved in anti-Habsburg politics, and tried to collect debts for six years, owed to her husband and herself from the Vienna court. And though she was now the head of a family of great status and privilege, dark rumors had started to circulate about other aspects of the Countess's behavior. Over the next few years, allegations of the Countess's atrocities became increasingly serious and spread throughout the kingdom. Even a Lutheran minister called Istvan Mayargi complained about her behavior to the royal court, but was ignored. But by 1610, King Matthias II could not ignore the situation anymore and assigned the Palatine of Hungary, her cousin by marriage, Count Georgi Terzo, to investigate the allegations. After a long, thorough investigation and taking over 300 witness statements, what Terzo discovered defied belief. It seemed that the Countess had been killing young girls, numbering in their hundreds, allegedly starting as far back as 1585. She was arrested later that year, and there was also physical evidence to support her alleged crimes. This was in the form of survivors and mutilated dead, dying, and imprisoned girls found at her properties at the time of her arrest. According to official record and testimonies given by witnesses, the atrocities she was alleged to have carried out were the abduction of numerous young girls, mostly between the ages of 10 to 14, and torturing them to death taking part in cannibalism and murdering 80 of her victims. It's said that the true figure could be between 36 and 650. The accounts of the atrocities often mention girls being severely beaten, burnt, the mutilation of their hands, the biting of flesh off their faces, arms, and other body parts, and freezing or starving to death. There were even allegations of hot needles being used, as well as girls being burned with hot tongs, and then being plunged into cold water. There were also claims that some girls were regularly whipped with nettles, while others were smeared with honey and then left to the mercy of the ants and wasps. There were infamous vampiric stories of the Countess drinking and bathing in the blood of her virgin victims to retain her youth. These accusations were recorded many years later and are therefore less reliable. The Countess was promptly put under house arrest and soon afterwards, put on trial. But the trial never concluded. Even though King Matthias wanted the Countess found guilty and then sentenced to death, Terzo convinced the King that such an act would adversely affect the standing of the nobility in the country. Due to political reasons, the trial was abandoned and the Countess was placed in solitary confinement in her castle. The maids who assisted her in conducting those murders were not so lucky. They were convicted and executed for witchcraft. The Countess was kept bricked up in a set of rooms within the castle, with only small slits left open for ventilation and the passing of food. Terzo was to note in his journal that she would suffer solitary confinement without light and without crucifix. She remained there for three years until her sudden death on August 21, 1614, at the age of 54. Some people think she was set up, as the king and many others owed her large sums of money. Therefore, discrediting her in such a manner was an effective way of getting out of paying their debts to her. Many relatives were envious of her wealth, and as she was relatively young, they felt that they might never get their hands on the inheritance in their lifetime. Though there is some truth to these claims, it's generally accepted that she was a power-crazed sadist and serial killer who was allowed to indulge her every whim due to her status and power in Hungarian society. The plague that made people dance until they died. Medieval Europe between the 14th and 17th centuries. Europe during the Middle Ages was a time of great hardships. 
nearly endless wars led to frequent famines. As the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes famously said, life, particularly for the peasantry, was unusually nasty, brutish, and short. One of the peculiar ways in which it appears the peasantry of the Middle Ages dealt with these hardships was through a bizarre phenomenon known as choreomania. The term is derived from the Greek words choros, meaning to dance, and mania, meaning madness or compulsion. Historical records from the 14th to the 17th century documents periods of dancing mania so frequently that they can't be dismissed as mere rumor or exaggeration. Outbreaks of this so-called dancing mania involve groups of people dancing erratically and uncontrollably, sometimes in their hundreds or even thousands. Like a disease, the mania would spread from town to town, and even country to country, as if it were contagious. Historical records are sometimes very detailed about these outbreaks, which affected men, women, and children, dancing often until they collapsed from exhaustion or injuries. The first sparsely recorded outbreak of dancing mania is actually from the 11th century, where on Christmas Eve in 1021, people are said to have danced en masse in the German town of Kulbeck. A couple hundred years later in Erfurt, another incident was recorded and around the same time in Maastricht, it was said that 200 people fell to their death while dancing on a bridge that collapsed under their weight. However, the first well-documented outbreak of dancing mania was in 1374 in the German town of Aachen. For reasons that are unclear, the people of Aachen started to dance involuntarily. They moved frantically until near the point of total exhaustion. Within weeks, this strange compulsion has spread like the plague to the Netherlands and northeast of France. Hundreds of people uncontrollably jumped, leapt, and twitched for days. Another well-documented outbreak happened 150 years later in France. There was a woman called Frau Trophea who started dancing in the city of Strasbourg in July of 1518 for weeks on end. She was gradually joined by more and more people, and the situation escalated when the city authorities provided a stage and hired musicians in hope of bringing the bizarre crisis to an end. Once the first dancers started their strange ritual, however, others joined in claiming to be overwhelmed by a compulsion. A manuscript in the city's archive of the time offers a glimpse of the scale of the epidemic that followed. It reads, There has been a strange epidemic lately going amongst the folk, so that many in their madness began dancing, which they kept up day and night without interruption until they fell unconscious. Many have died of it. While seemingly improbable, dozens of medieval sources from different towns mention both the 1374 and the 1518 incidents. The latter was even mentioned in the city of Strasbourg's municipal orders, and it is clear from these records that during both incidents, the people afflicted by this dancing mania were not simply shaking from some unknown plague, but actually dancing, albeit involuntarily. They were obviously in great physical and mental pain as well. The records detail that most of those with dancing mania also had horrible hallucinations and could be heard praying for absolution in the middle of their dancing fits. Often they barely ate or slept, and sometimes they were not even fully conscious of their actions. The theories of what actually happened to cause these epidemics varied across the centuries. Some blamed religious beliefs and demonic possession. Others suggested the existence of a dancing cult while others blame them on mass poisonings, which caused hallucinations and shaking. One of the most bizarre and yet widespread contemporary explanations was that the dancing mania was brought on by a curse from St. John the Baptist, or in other places, St. Vitus. Why or how either of these dead saints could have made such a curse is unclear, but so common was the belief that in many places the dancing mania was actually named after them, as in St. John's Dance or St. Vitus's Dance. In Italy, the dancing mania was sometimes called Tarantism, and it was believed to be brought on by either a spider bite or a dangerous poison. Later on, as medical science evolved, a similar condition to dancing mania was labeled Sydenham chorea, but this disorder was thought to only affect children, causing them to have involuntary tremors in the arms, legs, and face. In 1888, a German gentleman named Justus Friedrich Karl Hecke wrote a fairly comprehensive account of the dancing mania phenomenon entitled The Black Death and the Dancing Mania. 
In it, he imaginatively describes what he calls St. John's Dance as follows. They form circles hand in hand and appearing to have lost all control over their senses continued dancing, regardless of the bystanders, for hours together in wild delirium until at length they fell to the ground in a state of exhaustion. They then complained of extreme oppression and groaned, which they again recovered and remained free from complaint until the next attack. Modern researchers believe the outbreaks were most likely examples of mass psychogenic illness triggered by fear and depression. Both of the most well-documented manias of 1374 and 1518 were preceded by particularly bad periods of devastating famine, crop failures, and disease. Anxiety and fear combined with a religious belief that such hardships were the result of God punishing them for their wrongdoing made people, according to this theory, susceptible to mass delusions that may have gave them some reprieve from their dire situations. Ultimately, this too is just an educated guess. What is for sure, however, is that diagnosing a mass contagion from 500 years ago is not easy. We will probably never know what exactly caused the dancing mania of the Middle Ages, but the urge to dance away one's troubles isn't all that strange if you think about it.